Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan Serdak. This is my colleague, Louise Cold Taylor. We work for a company called Pixis Cultures. Uh, we do a lot of organizational coaching. We help build cultures that communicate better, that collaborate more together. And one of the key things when trying to do the kind of work that we do is to build safe spaces for people. Uh, just a quick joke, because I saw some people today that were that read the title and they said safe. Is it like safe the framework for agile? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about safe and secure spaces uh, for conversations. So I guess before we start talking about what happens in safe space, I think it would be cool to start by talking about what's an unsafe space. So um, the term an, an unsafe space, is that something that sounds familiar to you? Like just raise your hand if you feel like you kind of have a sense of what that means. I think that's pretty much everyone. So I know for me, an unsafe space, like a, one way for me to notice an unsafe space is if I'm in a <coughs> meeting and people start rolling their eyes, you know, I immediately know that that's not a place to speak up. Or if there's a lot of people sort of looking at a very interesting spot on the floor, kind of as if they're hidden under like a, an invisible blanket. You know, you're kind of like, hit like, like I'm not here. Um, those are just two simple signs to notice when the, when the safe has turned on space, when the safe has turned on safe. And I know what happens inside me is I want to escape. Like I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm thinking about how can I get out of here? Maybe even like, for real, like where's the door? How can I get out? But also just like, how can I just pretend I'm not here? You know, my inner dialogue starts to be, become very noisy. So that's just one way to notice. But I'd like to ask you, how do you notice that, how do you notice that the safe has turned on space? I, sorry, the space has turned on safe, those two words. Um, so I'd like to invite you to just take a moment and reflect upon like, what is your experience? Like, what do you experience? How do you notice it? And maybe just share with a, with a person next to you. And we're just going to take one minute to do this quickly. And when I raise my hand, you know it's time to get back. Raise your hands and finish your sentence and come back. And we're back. Thanks. What were the, some of the things that you talked about? How do you notice that the, safe has turned, the space has turned on safe? What do you experience? Just maybe one or two suggestions. Injunction against thinking out loud. Uh huh. So no thinking out loud. We're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Every time you say something, you're told off. Afraid yeah. to get, uh, afraid to be shut down, or afraid to be told off mm -hmm. when you say something. Yes, sir. Afraid to share your opinion. Afraid to share your opinions. Yeah. Last one. Kind of like blaming someone, putting the fault on someone, yeah. Or the fear of the witch hunt. We have, yeah. to, we have to find the person responsible. Yeah, the scapegoat. It's somebody's fault, right? Yeah. One of my favorite things, if mm -hmm. I can share mm -hmm. something quickly, when I think of unsafe space, um, I often work with clients when we're in certain meetings, in certain containers, and people go, oh, you can say anything here. It's a safe space. It's like, what, as soon as you walk out the room, there's someone waiting with... I don't know, you know, it's kind of why I chose that picture. So, you know, why do we need to say that this space is safe? Why, why do we need to reinforce that? Mm -hmm. well, because we grew up with yeah. Since Yes. Yes, so sometimes unsafe space is the fear of judgment. And sometimes it's the lack of permission. Who am I to say this mm -hmm. in this space? I was working with a scrum master yesterday. I'm sorry, you know me. I got to tell the story. <laughs> I was working with the scrum master yesterday, and they agreed in their retrospective that during the daily scrum meeting that someone was going to be the, the official police person, the person that can say, stop talking, you're talking too long. And I spoke to this person yesterday who volunteered, three people volunteered to be the police. So I was talking with the person yesterday, and I said, so how, how is that going for you? Well, haven't quite started yet, so wait a sec. We're going to go for two weeks, for which we're trying this. You're not going to say a thing. We're going to come back in the retrospective and again say, well, the, the daily scrum meetings are too long, right? But the person didn't feel they had permission. 
And I was telling them, look, they all told you, you can be the police. Mm -hmm. So I think often it, what makes this, the space feel unsafe is that we're <coughs> fear of being excluded, right? We're, fear, we're afraid of how, how we look. So I think a uh, nice transition into what is a safe space. Actually, let's do a little quote first. Mm -hmm. So in most organizations, nearly everyone is doing a second job no one is paying them for, namely covering their weaknesses, trying to look their best, and managing other people's impressions of them. Do any of you have this job? Is it part of your job description or something, or is it just something you do? So how about we jump into what is a safe space? So we talked about unsafe space. What is a safe space? How would you dis define that? A pub. Excuse me? A pub. a pub. What happens in a pub? What happens in the pub, yeah. So, you don't care as much. You yeah, don't you, care? You don't worry about the image as much. You don't worry. There's something casual, informal. You are yourself. You're yourself. No fear of consequences. No fear of blame. No need to justify. No need to justify. Yes. What makes it so hard to have a safe space? The need for power, the political game, sometimes that goes on. Yes. Did you ever experience a safe space in your work? What made that safe space? What made that space safe for you? No, I, you, I caught yeah. your disease. <laughs> <laughs> what made the space safe for you? No boss. No boss? <laughs> That's one way. <laughs> what was it about the no boss? Yes, no. Hierarchy? No fear of hierarchy. There was a point right there. Trusting the people that I'm talking with. And that trust takes time to build. You know, that's something that we forget sometimes inside of organizations. We need to practice talking to each other. We need to practice having awkward conversations for them to get better. The easy example is think about going to the gym. Right? When you go to who who here has worked out at least once in their life? <laughs> <laughs> Who stopped after three days? No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay, kidding aside. Um, when you think about it, when you start working out and you're going to the gym and you're doing curls, right, you start, let's say, for the sake of argument, with 20 pounds and you're going, oh my God, this is heavy, right? Then you do it for a week and what happens? You're sore, but it starts getting lighter and you start going to 25. And after a few weeks, you're at 30 and at 40. When you go back to 20, what happens? Easy peasy, right? It's the same thing for safe spaces. We need to practice to have some of the conversations that we're not used to having so that we can learn how to have them and make the space safer. I'm seeing my, my friend Roger here and I'm thinking I was doing work with his team uh, over the past couple of years and one of the things that we did with Roger's team is we created a weekly meeting where we were learning how to talk together. And the first meeting was a little bit awkward, was a little bit difficult. But if you go to the same meeting now, where people can go with conversations is completely different. But it's about the practice and it's about sometimes choosing to be in the little, in the space that's a little bit unsafe in order to create more safety, as ir ironic as that sounds. Are we clear on the safe space? How about what we wanted to do with you guys is we wanted to give you four tips uh, that will allow you to create a safe space around you for a meeting, for a conversation. Please don't see this just for business meetings. This could be even when we're having conversations with colleagues and we need to have a difficult conversation, there needs to be safety in that space. We need to create safety in that space. So these four tips apply in those, that type of context as well. So the first tip is taking the context into account. So what we mean by this is essentially uh, what's been going on in the team for the last two weeks. Let's say you're working in a team that's supporting a live production environment. There's been fire after fire the last two weeks. 
when we do a retrospective, maybe it needs to be a bit lighter. Maybe it needs to be a bit different. Maybe we need to change something to make it better for people. Another thing to take context into consideration is to consider why are we having this conversation in the first place? What triggered it? What created the need to have this discussion together? Another way of taking context into account is thinking about the relationship between people. Are these strangers? Are these people from different teams that are meeting together? How do these teams get along? Do they get along well, not well? How, how do I set up that conversation in that context? I need to take that into account. And finally, when we talk about taking context into account, we talk about the space. Where are we going to meet? Is it conducive to have the conversation that we're trying to have or not? If it's not, what do I need to do? Do I need to change space? Do I need to change something in the space? So that's taking context into account. Would you like to add anything? Any thoughts? No, I think, that's, uh, I think we have a little quote. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, do we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's, it's only the safe spaces one that didn't have one. So for me, context is the key. From that comes the understanding of everything. Okay? So if you want to create a safe space, it's actually useful to take a moment to reflect and prepare. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing my friend Martin back there. Yesterday we, we were actually preparing a meeting and we were going over some of these, uh, we were trying these tips together. We're, and it does create more depth for preparation instead of just arriving and improvising a meeting. So then the second one is, that can be very helpful is to formulate your own personal intention. And this is true, especially if you're the convener, let's say you're a convener of a meeting or you're the facilitator. Like how you show up is really, really important. Um, so my personal intention, like for, for instance for today, you know, my personal intention for coming in here is to share my learning, what I've learned so far with you. But it's also being curious because it's also acknowledging that I'm not necessarily the guru or the expert. I'm also here to learn from everybody, from you, and to create this learning experience. So how can I set my own personal intention and how can I include others? Like how inclusive is my personal intention? Because if my personal intention is just about what's in it for me, I may not create such a safe space for others. Like if I can set a personal intention that somehow includes others and includes what we're here to do, I'm much more likely to show up and be seen in that way by others. Um, so I had a few things I wanted to say. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, kind of like the main points. The, the one I like to add to this mm -hmm. is around the personal hygiene. Yeah. Like, uh, how do you prepare yourself to be grounded when you arrive in that meeting? It's your responsibility as, as the person convening the meeting to be ready for it. Um, people know before I do talks, I walk around with my headset and I walk around and people that know me look at me and go, oh, Steph, you're presenting in a bit, right? Okay, I'll leave you in your bubble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people kind of, in my case, people know, but as a facilitator, if you are having a crazy, hectic day and all of a sudden you show up at a meeting and your head is all over the place, the meeting is gonna go pretty, pretty much all over the place. It's your responsibility to show up grounded, to, sh to find a way mm -hmm to prepare yourself to lead that conversation or to lead that meeting. Yeah, and because it, it also ensures that you are taking care of the space, you mm -hmm. know, that, you, that you are in service of the space. So setting a personal intention can be a, a very powerful tool. And then sometimes <coughs> when we're in this meeting and we forget and think other things happen, just remember, why am I here? What's my personal intention? What am I here to do? Very powerful. I think we have a little quote. Lord, help me forgive those who sin differently than I. So what does this tell you? Nobody's perfect, including, you know, even ourselves. Even if we walk in with an intention that's a little bit awkward, sometimes it's, it's okay even for ourselves to say, look, I'm, I'm not in the right place, you know? I'm sharing the story, I have the story spinning in my mind where I showed up in a meeting once with a client and um, I was helping them prepare a presentation for something. And I was very impatient that day. Very, very, very impatient with that day. And it was so funny because they were, um, they were trying to work on it and my impatience was coming out. 
like, hey, you know, you should do this. Oh, you should do that. Oh. And I was, I was being a bit of a bully as a coach. It was kind of funny. So I said, okay, so I'm, I'm feeling myself. I'm observing myself doing this. Now, how do I fix it? So I started laughing. I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. A bit of a forced laugh, but eventually became a real one. And then the team looked at me and they went, what's wrong? I said, God, I'm a horrible person today. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm bullying all of you. That's not what I'm here to do. Tell me to stop for crying out loud. Don't let me do this to you. Then they looked at me, they laughed, and it kind of became okay to say, Steph, you're being impatient, you're being cranky, breathe. Right? But that's part of knowing your personal intention and finding a way to honor your personal intention. Especially, and especially if you know that the meeting or whatever you're about to do can become difficult. Mm -hmm. right? Then it becomes even more important. Yeah, which reminds me sometimes, you know, in meetings we get a little bit uncomfortable and we're making a joke or we're doing something that's creating something and it's our nervousness that's mm -hmm. kind of playing into it. So trying to know how we want to show up and try to honor that is important. Whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or a group meeting. Mm -hmm. Good for uh, the next one? Yeah, the next one. So the next one, framing the conversation. Also, again, if you're the convener or the facilitator of a meeting, this is very, very important. This speaks, this is about our shared intention. So this is about stating up front, why are we here? What are we here to do? What is the, um, you know, what's our desired outcome? Is there, if there is such a thing? You know, what is our agenda or our process? What are our, um, you know, working agreements or norms? And I'd like to give uh, three different examples. So I was, uh, at one point I was, um, facilitating these uh, community of practices for a group of scrum masters. And part of uh, the way we framed this was there's no homework and there's no um, action items to take away. It was really sort of a coffee break to come together and just share and talk and listen to each other. So that's how it was framed. That's what we're doing. Um, another is something I'm, another meeting I'm planning in a, in a couple of weeks. It's a group of diverse stakeholders who has to come together and sort of make some important decisions about some, a complex issue that's between them. Um, so in that kind of, like the framing can become something completely different. It becomes about what's in, what's in scope, what's out of scope, how do we go about this, how do we make the decision, so, you know, and what exactly are we walking away with? So very important to, to frame why are we here, how are we gonna get there? What are we doing together? The third example is, uh, was a feedback process I did with a group of managers um, where the framing, there was a lot of heavy framing and there was a very, very um, sort of heavy structure to how we were doing this. Uh, how are we giving each other feedback? What are the, sort of the norms around it? What are the, the working agreements? Even down to like little templates. How are we gonna say these things? Um, so all in the, in, the, in the name of creating the safety. And the more sort of ambiguous, the more personal, the more sort of risky um, the meeting is, like the more framing you need up front. And then, and that basically, that becomes the invitation. Like these are, this is the game, these are the play, these are the rules. Do you want to, you know, do you want to play? And it also helps people know what to expect. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when we go into those meetings and we, we feel kind of insecure, when we hear the process, it's like easier to say, oh yeah, this is going to happen, this mm -hmm. is going to happen. <sighs> mm -hmm. And it takes away sort of ambiguity and confusion and, you know, all of these things. It's like, okay, we know what to do. Not all meetings need all that. Like, it really depends what it is, but a good framing is, uh, is often helpful. Yes, and that's something that we often neglect. Like, you know, I have a client that what they used to do is they used to create signs in, in one of their working rooms around the purpose of the different meetings that they were having. And I remember when they started, I used to think, hmm, that's kind of special. But the interesting thing that it created by having that purpose of the meeting that was visible to everyone to having a default agenda visible for everyone was that if we ever veered off it, we could always go, hmm, okay, we're not meeting the purpose now of the meeting. Can, can we get back on track? Mm -hmm. it, it kind of created all that framing helped create security for people. Because it also helps everyone 
to remind each other and hold you know, ourselves and each other accountable for what we're here to do once we have that framing. Quote time. I think there's a quote. The first rule of politics is that nobody will tell you the rules. Don't know if you've ever experienced that inside your organizations. Have you ever seen some of those? So in this case here, with the framing of the conversation, we're saying it's kind of nice to have not necessarily rules, but to understand what are we here to do? How do we want to do it? One of the nice things, too, around framing the conversation, uh, it can help you when you're working with teams to do, to do certain things. If you know that you have, for example, a problem resolution process. Okay, so we're doing problem resolution. Let's use this process. Right? You kind of, you can develop the habit. And it's hard to optimize a process if you have no process. You're just going to change everything you're doing from scratch, restart from scratch without trying to see what piece is broken. So having a process for discussion is useful. Uh, I'll give you a very basic example of a process for discussion. What I use for problem resolution is kind of a four-step process. The first step of the process is, what is the problem? Can we, in a sentence or two, identify the problem and all agree this is the problem? And write it down. And write it down. Mm -hmm. The second part of the process is around what are the facts? What are the impacts of this problem? And then when we're talking, that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about solutions. We're just talking about impact and facts. And then the third piece is around what are po possible solutions? So when we talk about possible solutions, it's not about if Louise sa says something, go, oh, Louise, bad idea. No, great, let's just add it. Because the fourth step in the process is what do we want to do? Okay, so when we're talking about framing and creating a little process, it's basically creating steps around how are we going to have this discussion. We kind of touched on this one a little bit. Um, this is kind of our favorite slide in the deck, holding and cultivating the space. So holding and cultivating the space, we touched on it a little bit. If we have good framing and people are going outside of the frame, we have the frame to come back and we can say, hey, one of my favorite ways of doing this, and some people that know me are gonna, are gonna smile, but I'll often ask, are we having the right conversation? And if I ask, are we having the right conversation, people know. I don't know sometimes, but sometimes they'll talk about something that seems off track to me. But if I ask, are we having the right conversation? They're gonna go, may not seem like it, but yes, because, oh, okay, keep it going. Oh, no, no, it's not the right conversation. We're talking about something else right now. Ah, okay. That's a nice way to hold and cultivate space. And the other thing is about naming what's happening. It's about saying why uh, I was facilitating, I wasn't facilitating, I was observing a retrospective for a team last year. And actually it wasn't your team, Audrey, <laughs> but it was another team in the company. And what happened was that people were, uh, pe people were angry at each other. It was really interesting. They were angry, they were getting mad, there was almost a fight that broke out. Uh, in the retrospective. So I said, well, time out, time out. I'm not facilitating, but your facilitator has no clue what to do with this right now. So I'm gonna come in and help, okay? Yes, okay, so what is this about? What I see right now is a bunch of people in a room upset that do not even wanna be here. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, okay, so now let's move on and talk about why, and let's talk about how do we make this productive. That's part of naming what's happening. If you see someone that's always interrupting, sometimes it's useful to say, well, uh, Louise, can, can you please give a bit, of, a bit of space for others to speak? Or I'm noticing that. Um, thinking of another quick example, then I'll move on to the, the detail. Um, with a client last year, we were doing a transformation meeting and we were taking turns facilitating the meeting. And what happened at one point is that we, at the end of the meeting, we were always naming the next facilitator. So one meeting we asked, so who's facilitating the next one? And no one raises their hand, no one says anything, crickets, not a sound, not a peep. 
okay, that sounds cool. So who is facilitating the next meeting? And again, no one volunteered. So we ended up naming it. We ended up saying, why? Why is it that we're experiencing crickets right now? I'm telling the story slightly differently because we actually did this part in the second meeting saying, why did it break down in the first meeting? Can we just have that conversation for 30 minutes and talk about that and learn to be awkward with that? But without naming it, you're just, it's just kind of going to be accepted. You see what I mean? If you see people that are bullying others in a meeting, if no one calls it out, nothing changes. As part of naming what's happening, one of my favorites is when someone, have you ever had this in a meeting, someone who throws a little grenade in the middle of the room, a little verbal grenade, they say something just so that people react? One of my favorite ways to manage that is to go, wow, so Martin, uh, how does this help the conversation that we're having right now? Oh, it doesn't. So we can put that aside and move on? Okay, thank you. Back on track. That's part of cultivating and holding the space. Naming what's happening. And thinking about the intention that you walked in with, you know, the intention you walked in with and the framing that happened in, at the beginning as well. Yeah. And again, we talked about reminding people of the framing. Uh, and it's also about creating space for people to speak. So if, if in a meeting it's always the same people that speak, sometimes it's useful to go talk with some of, some of the people that aren't speaking on the side, help them see how do you speak up, how can you speak up, do you want to speak up, how can I help you speak up. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. I was working with the management team once, and as part of cultivating the space, I did an experiment with them for two meetings in a row, two three-hour meetings. I was calling everything I saw in the meeting. Audrey, why are you rolling your eyes every time Louise speaks? Martin, why are you breathing like that? What does that mean? And I called everything for two meetings in a row, and people were like shocked. Going, oh. Okay, cool. So after two meetings, I stopped, and I didn't do it anymore. And what happened is all of a sudden, Martin did something, and during the break, Louise comes to me and says, Ah, oh, you know, Steph, did you see when Martin did that? Yeah. Why didn't you say anything? Well, why didn't you say anything, Louise? Right? So then we got into a conversation around how can she bring that up? But sometimes people don't know. You don't know what you don't know. You can't see. So when you allow people to see things, then it's about how, how do you allow them to do something with it? Yes? Does this uh, bring some unsafe in the room? Yes. Yes. But sometimes it also creates a big sigh of relief because someone named it. Yes, mademoiselle. So in terms of the naming it, what you said to whoever in that meeting sounded like what I would want to be saying inside, but is there a little bit of a more politically correct or that doesn't matter because there was definitely a tone of sarcasm or something. Yes. Yes. So, as a coach, sometimes you have a little bit more permission, and sometimes, like my clients are used to me coaching on the fly. Thank God, <laughs> uh, because if not, it would be a bit more difficult. Uh, and sometimes it's about you can you you can game it a little bit, so you can easily go see someone and say did you notice that you're doing this in meetings? And you have a side conversation about it. Did you ever notice this? Why, why is that happening for you? And sometimes you'll realize the, pe the person doesn't even know. And then it's, is it okay if I tell you live next time when it happens in the meeting? And I do that with some people. And then you get clear permission that, yeah, it's okay. So then it's about saying it in a way that's respectful of the person. You can't, you know, and I'm going to be a little bit blunt about it. You can't say, you darn idiot, why did you do that again? That doesn't work. People won't like that live. Right? And if I may answer as well, I think, you know, again, it goes also back to the, the context and your intention. Like, what is the context? Like, what kind of group? How can you speak in this group? <coughs> Who are you in this group? 
Like, what's appropriate? Like, so take that into account, and also your personal attention. Like, how is it that you want to show up? Like, different, you know, different people will show up differently and will intervene in a group differently. Yeah. Um, so, and and maybe in the beginning, you're you're thinking about what I would have loved to have done and would have said, and sometimes it it, it could be about going back and like, what would I have said? And then yeah. the next time you're in that situation, you know, try and try and say something, but in a way that honors who you are and yeah. how you want to say it. Yeah, and you know, there's. The important thing in what Louise is saying too is there's an important distinction between speaking your truth and vomiting your truth. So when you're speaking your truth and you say, well, this is kind of real for me and this is how I'm living this, people can usually hear that. Or if you come and you say, I have something to say right now and it's not going to be, it's a little bit unpleasant, it's a little bit awkward, can I do this? Because then you're framing it. You're already yeah. framing that something will come and, it's and you know, it might be difficult to hear. Yeah. And sometimes the holding and cultivating the space is about saying, okay, so look, this conversation blew up. This was my personal intention. We arrived here. Can we please do a reset so I can come back to here? And people can hear that too. And again, personal intention has a lot to do with it. Because if people know that you're coming from a place where you're good-hearted, that you have good intentions, a lot more stuff goes through. Do you want to do an experiment? Well, let's do a quote have, first. I think we have a quote. We have a quote. Last quote. Okay. So the instant people perceive disrespect in a conversation, the interaction is no longer about the original purpose. It's now about defending dignity. Yes. I Actually, speaking up helped create safe space for the facilitator because the facilitator was really in the place where they were trying to get back sanity to the meeting and they couldn't do it and they needed help. Yes, and sometimes there's a coaching context to it too where uh, in, in the context... In a live context, there's some places where, as a coach, I'll ask people, do you want to manage the whole thing? And I won't interfere. But if I see that it's someone completely inexperienced, and in that context, with that group, what made it more difficult was we were trying to build capacity in facilitators, and facilitators were dropping like flies because people weren't helping them inside the meetings. So the groups were hostile to the facilitator. So then if, if they can't manage it, the easy answer for those facilitators was, I'll never do this again. And you don't want that to happen. So you can have the conversation with them again around, you know, and I, I had already mentioned I'd be there to help if anything was going to happen. So I think you bring up a good point, but and again, yeah, it's all, it all depends on the context and on yes. the relationship and the culture and, you know, the history. Um, but yeah, that could be in some places, maybe that could happen, but maybe not in this case. Would the Rosenberg avoid communication be appropriate? Oh, yeah. Yes. For sure. So the question Very. is, if non-violent communication would be appropriate? Yeah. Do you want to handle that one, or do you want me to go? Um, I have ideas. Sure, okay. Yeah, so the question was, does Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication apply in holding and cultivating the space? It does, um, especially when you hear someone trying to name something, trying to express a need, and they're, having, they're struggling expressing the need. If you can, can uh, be, kind of be the channel to express that need, is this what you're needing right now? Oh, yes. Is this what you mean right now? And use some of the framing 
of uh, nonviolent communication. So nonviolent communication is around what I observe, the feeling, uh, it's, there, I have one missing right now in my head. It's the feeling, the unmet need, and the request. Okay, so if you're able to express, you seem to be feeling frustrated right now, and you start using that as a way to manage people that are a little bit more difficult or under pressure or upset inside a meeting, if you're able to name, help them name what they're feeling, it's easier for them to kind of let some of it go because they feel, they feel a little bit more heard. And they wouldn't feel threatened as they were maybe kind of Exactly. Yes, and sometimes reframing is also a way to cultivate the space. So sometimes you have people in meetings that are trying to express something, but they're having a hard time expressing it. It's difficult for them to say, but you kind of have an inkling of what they're saying because they've spoken to you about it, or you kind of, you're just picking up some of the stuff. Sometimes it's useful to say, uh, wait, is this what you mean? And then people can opt in and say, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Okay, let's build on that. And sometimes even by in holding and cultivating the space, it's also about listening to all the nonverbals. Like, what are people's body language doing? And can you reflect back? Like, is, some, is half the room, you know, they want to get out the door, or someone just, like, like, you know, just name what's going on. It seems to me that maybe people are tired, need a break, or someone wants to say something. They're kind of like, all the time, but they're holding back, you know, maybe people are holding back, or whatever it is you're, but just naming it. Like, I'm noticing this is happening. It helps. Shall we do an experiment? Yeah, I think we should. Okay, so we're gonna do a little experiment with the fishbowl. Uh, do you want to frame your topic a bit? Uh, sure. So uh, we would like to invite three participants up to do a little fishbowl activity. Does anyone here know what a fishbowl activity is? Not a whole lot, all right. So a fishbowl activity is basically a conversation so it's a little circle here, we're gonna have, so I'm gonna be sitting here with three of you, and we're gonna have a little conversation, we're gonna practice some of these things. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it for the fishbowl. So do we want to start by inviting people? Yes. So yes. So do we have three people that would like to come up in front and have a conversation about how I made the space unsafe for myself or others by trying to save my own face. So we're taking the expression from the, from the start and we're playing a little bit with it. But the gist of the question is around, uh, is, ever, is anyone willing to come in front and tell us about a time where they made the space unsafe for themselves and for others? Ah. You know, this is really an invitation to come up and to explore a topic together, to learn together, um, and to find out how are we, you know, helping or hindering safe space, maybe intentional or intentional. Like, and if you think about the unsafe space is where we want to hide, so that's kind of where we want to wear a uniform so that we blend in and nobody notices us. Safe space is not about being naked. You know, safe space is about dressing authentically. So it's about making a choice what you want to say and what you don't want to say. But it's about being yourself and share however, you know, how much you want to share. Uh, so if we have three people who would love to get a really um, exciting learning experience, I invite, the, I invite you to come here to the circle. Okay. So <clears throat> we're, we're going to let them settle for a little bit. Uh, we're going to do a little exercise, the rest of the group, as they're having the conversation. So what I'd like is I'd like to separate the room kind of in four. So like the first quarter of this room, the front quarter, I'd like you guys to observe what are the pieces of context that we heard. Because we were talking about uh, our first tip that was about taking the context into account. So make little notes about what you see around the context part. The second quarter of the room in back, I'd like you guys to listen for things that reveal intention. So intention of the people, intention from Louise, things that reveal intention, okay? The quarter here, what I would like you guys to listen for is for the framing. What are some of the pieces that contributed to the framing of the conversation, the framing of what's being shared? 
and the last quarter of the room in the back. I'd like you guys to listen for the uh, holding the space, the holding and the cultivating of the space. Okay, so I'm gonna gently turn my mic away and Louise, maybe you wanna get yeah. that mic out. And, just, and your observations can be either about what's happening here in the fishbowl or what people are talking about. So we're gonna let people talk for about 10 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes, and then we're going to do a debrief. Okay, so then we're going to do a debrief as a group. So just make notes on your area, and we'll share after as a group. So I'd like to start with just a little bit of context, you know, just to, because here we are, you know, the four of us in this circle, we're at an Agile Tour conference, we're in this room. We are strangers, except I know Bach, uh, but the rest of us are we're strangers, we've never met. Um, there's, a, there's a whole uh, audience behind us. Um, what else, what else do we want to say about context? And maybe we want to try the mic as well to see if people can hear us. Is this context right now? Yeah, the context we're in, like we're gonna have a conversation. What's our context? Okay, well, everybody here is familiar with Agile. Mm -hmm. This is the last session of the day. Yeah. I think everybody's tired. <laughs> I know, I'm on four <laughs> espressos, and... <laughs> you found where they served espresso. Uh, Van Hood, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's for the context. Um, and like I said, we're familiar with Agile, so this is gonna be our context. We will probably be discussing situation in one of the uh, Agile ceremonies, and how inadvertently one of us uh, screwed it up. Uh, as, uh, as this says, uh, how, how I made it unsafe for myself and for others. Can everybody hear, Alex? No? So you okay, I, I, I right guess a bit so closer. Is, is there anything else that needs to be said about uh, our context? I guess I, I just to add that I think everyone here is, wants to learn about safe space. So we have, I'm guessing, all a commonality where we've either been in a space we felt was unsafe or us in our roles as either Scrum Masters, product owners, or in the Agile community, we want to learn more about how to create safe space to get more pieces. So we feel supported by all of you because we've all opted into this session about safe space. I think we don't know most of you guys and you don't know most of us, so um, <clears throat> it's a learning journey for us and for you. So I think we're both all here to learn, basically. Yeah. Well, so what I'd like to do next is just take a moment, the four of us, and see if we can set a personal intention. And just think about maybe a quality that you want to bring to this conversation. And if you're completely blank, I, I offer just being present. Just present. So just take a moment and formulate a word and then send your intention into the center. And then next, let's take all of us, let's take three seconds to look into everybody's eyes and just telepathically send that intention. And then we're ready to talk. experience they had where perhaps the space wasn't safe and you'd like to explore perhaps how did you even you know contribute to it or not preventing it from happening and maybe we're just exploring I have the mic so I can start um, so we're going through a pretty pretty big transformation <coughs> in my team and We've been working a lot on Agile, introducing Agile, and we've gone from integration to software development, so a lot of changes at the same time. And I can tell I'm working with a team, and when I talk to them, there's an unsafe space because the questions don't come back with answers. It's a fairly big group often when I talk to them, and I'm trying to create this safe space. And I would say one time that was actually very difficult for me, and actually a few times, you always have these one or two people that are very vocal, um, talking over people, and so pretty, nobody, just picture this, nobody's talking, and you've got this one person always, not heckling, but almost, and you're trying to get everybody's feedback, but you always have this one guy with the same questions and picking on the same topic, and obviously haven't been able to answer it properly at this point, but you kind of get annoyed at one point, and your character will change, 
And if you do address them, and I have, address them in a more authoritative way, you've just broken that safe space even further. So that's been one of my challenges. How do you deal with the one person or two people that are actually willing to talk, but are going a bit awry in the topic, not really understanding the impact on the team? And if you react to it, it actually has a con counter effect. So you, so what, what do you see as your contribution to the situation? Like, so what did you try and what did you, what did you notice? What happened? Um, well, yeah, so I've been trying this with my team for a while. And I, I'd say, you know, 30, 40 people you're trying to talk to. So it's hard to create a safe space. There's the uh, people aren't willing to talk necessarily in front of big teams like that, working hard trying to do it, asking questions to individuals. Some people talk more. But again, the reaction that it, my reaction, that's what I've been working on. And how do you not entertain somebody who's trying to steal the meeting? Just t somehow tone it down and still allow others to, to speak. So that's been my challenge. So what did you, what did you do? So when this person was talking, what did you actually um, say or do? Or it's been happened a few times. But um, it's, it's mostly about not being able to address their, their questions specifically and kind of shutting them down as opposed to, actually, I don't know what to do yet. I've been trying a few times. And it's not that they're wrong necessarily, but the way they bring it up, and it's kind of a, an attack almost. So how do you tone it down and not react to it? And that's what I haven't been able to, to do. So sometimes I've tried just trying to respond. Others, you know, just looked at him and kind of blank stared, not sure what to do. But it has an impact on the rest of the room. I can tell that. And how can you tell that? Everybody's looking away at one point, and just you, you've lost the room, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share or have some uh, comments and questions for, for all? I guess I can do both if you would so like. I, I, I've seen very similar things. Um, I'm a product owner. We're, we're going through a similar large agile transformation, multiple teams trying to do different new technologies. Everyone's learning. Uh, and you get some people that, you know, they become, they're ingrained maybe in what they've been done and they're throwing those kind of challenges out. And they, we need all the clarity and all the understanding before we can move ourselves forward in a new direction. Um, so we're, some of the ways that I've responded back to that, if it's a technological challenge, I said, well, I'm, I'm open to your solutions. How can we bring you in and work with everyone here to make something happen or bring it forward? I know if it's just generally... Um, call it party pooping on the, on the things that's going on. It's harder to, to bring that back. But I know we've had similar, similar challenges in trying to turn it around and bring them into a solution-oriented environment so then other people can pile in on the positive solution as opposed to feeling that negativity that's getting them to stare at their feet or the wall. So what did you actually do? Okay. Well, I was going to ask, what did you no, do and what happened? I guess uh, in some of the cases, it's, it's worked well where people actually are going away and they're thinking, well, I, I think I have a new solution actually that we could work with. And at a previous company, we worked with a different technology. I'm like, well, we don't want you to run too far in another direction. But at the same time, take a few hours of your day, do a proof of concept and bring it back. And you know what? We have an architecture team that's going through it. Let's set up a meeting with you and them and let's actually talk about it. Even if it's not the direction you're going to go forward with as a team necessarily, they still feel heard, they still feel understood. And then maybe at the end with the conversation, they they still feel that, okay, maybe this direction we're going in is for the best. I can buy in. Let's all, let's all move forward together. So you're not necessarily talking about a, a, an experience where you were trying to save your own place. That's okay. I just, I just want to yeah, no, that's it. That I was getting to that one next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess from my perspective, what I'm talking about, we have multiple teams um, really relying on each other for, from technology solutions and trying to build new technologies. A lot of times we're waiting on other teams to deliver pieces of technology that we need to use to deliver our, our software or our solutions. So in, our, in the early days, it was very easy to say, we're waiting for you. You're, you're the reason that I'm not getting my pieces done, which creates a very blame-heavy space where you're not being collaborative. So um, recognize that own behavior in myself and some of the other people that were there and tried to turn that around a little bit. And as opposed to saying, you're late, <coughs> it's, I understand you're having difficulty doing what you're doing. How can we help? What can we do to make it easier for you to do things, to try and bring that Make them feel like we're not all blaming them for what's happening. We know it's new. How do we bring you on board and have a, a safer location to talk it? Okay, do you want to share? Um, so in Agile, in Lean, there is this principle of meeting people where they're at. And I guess at one point I was uh, quite impatient to get my team to start using uh, SDPI metrics. This is a software development performance index from Rally. 
it's amazing and I love it, but they weren't ready for this. And as soon as I suggested, as soon as I said something about metrics, there were people, I guess, traumatized from their previous experiences. Um, they were concerned that uh, the metrics would be used against them. And immediately the room got polarized and I got like, you know, it, it, it's, it's instantly it was us and them and I became them. And um, <laughs> so. So what did you do? You, like um, well, I realized that I should just slow down and introduce it slowly. And, and maybe there is prelim preliminary steps to be taken where people would learn that not all metrics are evil, but also to understand that, well, it's safe. You know, that uh, these metrics are for them to measure themselves, to get better. It's not for uh, management or for somebody external to them to, you know, measure and judge them. Um, and I guess that knowledge was not present in the team at the moment. And, um, well, not just the framing, but but also like the the maturity, I guess, of the team to the, the to to feel the ownership of their own process. You know, um, it was uh, I guess they were at the level where uh, they were still feeling like the process is imposed on them by like an external uh, an external entity by by the management by the company. You know, so before you know, uh, telling people for suggesting such metrics, it would have been better to uh, make sure that they feel comfortable and safe, and that they see the need. You know, the why mm -hmm. that the metrics are needed. So uh, that's that's my story. Great. I think Stefan is giving us a time clue. Yeah, we have about we have about eight minutes or so left. So if we want to debrief. Yeah. Okay, so what did you notice in the conversation? I asked you, a few of you to observe different things. What did you guys observe inside the conversation? Yes, sir. There was respect, nobody interrupted anybody. There was respect, no one interrupted anybody. Yes, that's very good. What else? Clear framing by Louise. Clear framing from Louise at the beginning around what we were doing and why. Okay. How did the people look on the chairs? They were looking at each other. They were also looking comfortable, weren't they? The people that came up, did you feel safe or unsafe? Or how safe? How safe? 80%. 80%? I think they were professional. Excuse me? Being professional. Being professional? Okay, let's come back to the question for the people that came up. So we had, a, we had an 80% safe. How, how safe was it for the people that were here? How, how safe? 70, 75%. Okay. Yeah. So as you were realizing what this conversation was about, it kind of provided safety. What else? Okay. <laughs> they changed the signal on me. Earlier they showed two and I said, two minutes? What? <laughs> everybody, everybody felt included. Everybody felt included? They had to participate. They had to participate. Okay, but here's the thing, they opted in, right? We made an invitation. If no one, and this was the risk in all this, if no one could have came up, right? So what made it possible for people to want to come up? Guys, what made it, why did you choose to come up? No, let's talk about it honestly. So, you know, it's about being here is about wanting to share experiences. It's, a, it's about 
you know, wanting to show up, essentially, is what you're saying. Okay. What else, guys? What so made it? What was that part of? Holding and cultivating the space and the parts that we were saying. Okay. What else did? So people each sharing their context facilitated converging together. I'm repeating for the recording. <laughs> Is there anything else? Yes. The personal intention wasn't really explicitly, uh, I mean, everyone uh, kind of uh, decided it in their head, but it wasn't really uh, like expressed. It was. And that's kind of reality as well, because when we do this in real life, as someone convening a meeting or someone getting ready for a conversation, we don't always name that intention. You know, we'll name the framing, but we won't necessarily name how we're planning on showing up. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to frame because it sounds weird when we frame or it sounds weird sometimes if we try to bring a process or introduce a process. It's kind of, we need to develop that habit and, and that, that capacity of doing that. Yes? yes? Yes. It's sort of a starting point at least for you know, framing it so at least people know what you're trying to do, walk away from the meeting with or what you're trying to accomplish in the 45 minutes or hour or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to cultivate the space if you have a clear objective as to why you're here. And it sets expectations you know, for other people in the room to sort of have a better idea of what you're, they're here to talk about or what you're hoping to get out of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll just take a moment to thank you because I see that our, our time is up. Do you have some final words you'd like I, to? Yeah, well, I, I guess I want to I thank everybody for coming and to thank the participants who, uh, who came into the, to the fishbowl. And, yeah. I'd, I'd like to thank you guys as, as well. What we did is we prepared a nice little handout. We prepared an English and a French version of the four steps. That's what we're going to share on the Agile Tour website. So it'll be something concrete that you can look look at as a checklist to help you prepare. So thank you very much. It was a lot of fun having you here and we appreciate it. Thank you. And good luck. Yes. <laughs>